Dyson was into design thinking before design thinking was a thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's core to your DNA, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think before anyone coined the phrase design thinking, James was already in that mode and pretty much had been since the origins of the company. Uh, and that, I think that stayed with the company very strongly through the, the 20 or so years that the, that the company's been in existence. In fact, if anything, it's probably deepened uh, what is now called design thinking because there's more of us and we're all thinking in that kind of same vein. Um, did, did he hire a lot of designers from the beginning or was Yeah, absolutely, it, yeah. absolutely. In fact, a lot of the early people who joined the company were, had gone through at the time in, in, uh, uh, in UK universities, they were running design engineering courses. Um, that's became, that became less common going forward. But in, in that point in time, we were getting design engineering courses. So often people would do a four-year a four undergrad program in design and then a master's program on, uh, sorry, on engineering, then a master's program in design. And that was the nucleus of the company from which then it grew uh, pretty prolifically from there. Yeah. So I think people are pretty familiar with the, the vacuum cleaners, but, I, but I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the hair dryer uh, because I, it's, not a, it, it's not a product I use a lot. Me neither. Uh, uh. But, um, but you, you, we had a fascinating conversation about how you thought about, I mean, I, I don't think people realize the hair dryer needed to be reinvented, but it did need to be reinvented. And, and can you talk a little bit sure. about that process? Yeah, well, we're generally, we, we like to go and disrupt industries, and we generally do that through technology. Uh, and so when we look at different industries, we look at the technology that we have or the technology that we need in order to go and disrupt that, and then we move. And when we looked at the hairdryer industry, it's going to be interesting when people tune in and they see two people like us talking about hairdryers. <laughs> but uh, when we look at the hairdryer industry, we thought, here's a product which for 50 years really hadn't really been touched. Hadn't changed at all. Pretty much. And so, and they were awkward, they were noisy, and probably most importantly, they damaged hair. And so, like, the whole DNA of Dyson is that we start at the very, very core of what's the problem that we need to solve for the customer. It's, it's not focused on design, it's not focused on, on um, the engineering aspects, it's focused on what is but, the core but problem. But was it well known that hair dryers, I mean, do you think the customers were saying, oh my God, get us a new hair dryer? I don't know that the customers were, but when we looked at that industry, we said, this industry needs changed. Yeah. And it was the same when we looked at the vacuum cleaner industry. I mean, within minutes of using a bagged vacuum cleaner, the, bag, the pores within the bag would clog up and you would lose suction. Now, we're customers at that point screaming out and saying this is, this is a poor product. Not until we came along and said, this is a poor product and there's one much better. And the same with, uh, with the hairdryer. So talk so, about what you had to do to make this work. So when we looked at the hairdryer, we said, OK, there's, there's certain elements to that. It's difficult to use. It's heavy. It's top heavy because most people got lazy and they take something like this, which is, which is an off-the-shelf motor, and they put it in the back of the, the hairdryer. And then they put a huge heater element in front and they just blow air at high temperatures until it dries your hair. It damages your hair, it's awkward to use and it's very noisy. So, that, so we, we decided we wanted to really reinvent that. And the first stage of that was to say, okay, let's get the motor in the handle. And we get the motor in the handle, it takes away the weight and it makes it much easier to use. But, the, so, but you still, the handle's gotta be small enough. The handle's gotta be small enough. So the first thing we then, does back to the customer, back to the problem, we then measured over 300 people's hands from across the world. We've literally measured people's hands. We knew that a big demographic would women, be women. Women, not bald women. men. Not bald men. <laughs> uh, I've, I've never asked a bald man to, uh, to, to, to measure his hands, I'm glad to say. But, um, so we measured lots of people's hands across, across the world. We found out that the optimum size for the motor would need to be 28 millimeters. But in order to get the right pressure, and the right airflow, which is about 14 liters per second that we needed from this, we then had to reinvent the motor itself. So we had to go from something this size to something this size. And is that as powerful as that? Yes, but the only way it gets that powerful is because this rotates at 115,000 RPM. So that was really the first challenge that we faced as an engineering team then to say, okay, we need to go reinvent the nucleus of the hairdryer, which is going to be obviously the digital motor. And, and then what about the heat? How, what, the heat damage? How did you prevent the well, heat damage? Well, even inside this, we had to then look at vibration, noise, wear, tear, and make sure that this was working first. Then we had to figure out what is the new heater element. So we invented then a new heater element that could go 
around the design of the, the product. Now that did two things. This is not really about the design. This is about functionality. So there's a long pathway of air which takes out turbulence and takes out noise and allows us to then circulate that air. If you're familiar with our, our fans, our bladeless fans, they use a technology called the Coanda effect, which you then get trailing air coming out. So as we push air out the nozzle here, the design trails air, which volumizes that air to about three times. Um, but then we wanted to make sure that we checked the temperature coming out of the, the right. nozzle, because it was very important for heat damage. Right. So we then, uh, we then invented a, a, a device which uses a glass bead thermistor, which sits right at the end of the temperature nozzle and checks the temperature. But so we, it, it modulates, it, it keeps a it, steady temperature? It, it keeps a steady temperature, but the way in which to do that is you need to then have a microprocessor which can modulate that 20 times a second. So now we go from a hairdryer, which is basically combined of one big motor that you buy very cheaply from whoever, to a custom-built digital motor, which is inside uh, a custom-built um, machine with a custom-built design uh, element for the heater, and then, of course, a microprocessor, which is controlling. Well, the we have some video of, of this process that uh, I, I'd like to play while we're talking about it. But, but, here's, but here's the thing. Okay, so you reinvented, you totally reinvented the hairdryer. Uh, you got the motor into the handle. You got rid of the heat damage. But you put it on the market for $400. I mean, what did hair dryers cost before that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what they cost before that because it's probably sometimes best not to look. But, um, <laughs> but didn't somebody say, you can't sell a hair dryer for $400? There was a few people that said that may, be, that may be in the high end of the price point. But I think the real thing here is that people recognize value. And that value proposition, you remember, you use this every single day, sometimes two, three times a day. If you can say so, it's, so what we managed to do with the hairdryer was we made it lighter, we made it much easier to use, we yeah. made it much quieter, we made it safe, and we made it much quicker. So if you're drying your hair every day, six, seven, half, we get, we get reports up to half the time it normally takes in a normal hairdryer, you can dry your hair safely with a Dyson because of the way it's been. So you put it on the market for $400 and what happens? Well, we put it on the market for $400. It was really a first foray into, let's say, the beauty sphere. Uh, predominantly, we had been in uh, domestic products and, and, and so on. Um, and that allowed us then to see the appetite for, for those products. Uh, and it's when you produce a product which adds real value to that customer, you see it come alive pretty quickly. So the sales took off. It's been a very, very successful product. Better than you thought it was going to be? Much better than I thought it was going to yeah. be. But, but, you know, I'm probably the, the, the worst guy. I'm, I'm focused in on the design and the, and the, uh, and the manufacturing aspects of this. Um, when you look at how well that's going to do in market. I think the other thing here is what's happened in social media has allowed these products to take off on their own. Yeah. If it's a good product and it resonates with that young demographic, especially uh, in, in Asia, which is one of our top markets for this, then the bloggers and the vloggers and social media takes over. And you actually don't need to promote it. The other area that you have, have really uh, uh, transformed is air purification. Can you talk a little bit about how you got to that? Sure. And again, that one starts at the core problem of what's the, what's the problem that we're trying to solve for the customer. And you can see in many countries around the world, the outside air um, quality is pretty poor. And there's lots of applications now that show you that outside air quality. So we started to look really deeply at what that meant, not just about PM 2.5, which was the big, uh, the big poster child of that problem, but we actually took it down to PM 0.1 which is a much, much smaller particle size and actually much more harmful to a lot of people mm. than the PM2.5. We took it then further into, uh, into uh, NO2 and nitrogen dioxide, which is, which is prevalent in where people live near busy streets and so on, and we put lots of sensors into that, uh, that product. That then allowed our customers to see the benefits real time through the app, we then wrote uh, an application layer that put it onto your iPhone or your Android. You can actually device. watch the reduction in particles in your you air. See, and you know when it's safe and that will, it turns green and lets you know. It shows you the outside air temperature or the air, air quality might be, might be red. Yeah. Internally, you can then see in our app that it's green and we, we were talking about this yesterday, but you said you did have to tell some people to close the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't purify the world. We tend to uh, have to do that within a confined space. But that, again, has been a really successful product. In fact, some of the, some of the most heartening emails that I get are from um, parents who have said, I had a child who's got asthma or who's got allergies, 
we bought a Dysonia purifier, we put it in the bedroom and, and the kids had a, had a first night's sleep in years and that, that in itself is something which gets you out of bed in the morning and wants you to keep uh, it. Tim Brown was talking er earlier about the transition from products to uh, services that's happening in many industries. Do you think that's going to happen with you? Or are you going to go from selling air purifiers to selling clean air in your apartment as a service or from selling vacuum cleaners to selling uh, cleaning service? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there'll be many different business models that work for us. There'll be the, the, the wholesale model that people buy either online. The other, the other big change, of course, we're seeing is that people are, are moving to the online channel and they want that information real time from the, from the manufacturers themselves. So we've built a huge online channel to capture that, that demand from our customers. We can explain our technology, we can explain the machines and the benefits much more um, uh, appropriately than some of the other channels that we would sell through. And in the same way, we can offer that as a service as well. If you want clean air, healthy hair, clean carpets and so on, clean floors, then a potential business model would be to offer that as a subscription service or as a, a service model. Can you talk a little bit about how you make design core to the culture at Dyson? And let's run that other video while you're doing that because I think it sort of illustrates the, the kind of workplaces that you've created. Well, we've taken it all the way back now. Uh, and this, this video here shows you actually our, our campus in the UK. This is the student campus that you see, the student accommodation. This is some of the young graduates that we've got. And just to explain, we're kind of designing the designer. We've taken it right back now. We have 17 year olds on campus. Uh, You're educating them. We're educating. So what we've done is we've started Dyson University. Uh, and what we do is we take in uh, undergrads. We have a four year undergrad program, engineering program. Um, and they come in and they work for us. So they're actually employees. It's a very different degree than most. So they work for two days a week uh, on their academic studies. And then they work for three days a week on live projects within the company with real engineers, with real deadlines, with real problems to solve. And then after obviously that four years, they will graduate as a, as a fully fledged engineer. And how is that education different than they would get if they went to a straight engineering school? Well, first of all, they get that cross function between the different disciplines, often in schools. And of course, ac academia trails industry, yeah, generally speaking, um, in some industries more than others, but certainly it trails it. So what they get is they get that real time cross fertilization between hardware, software, computer science, data, data analytics, all of that is happening within a real product we're working. So they're getting that cross spectrum of learning, dealing with those different engineers, I think some of the best engineers in the world, on a real project and being asked to go and perform and, and actually contribute to those products themselves as, as undergrads. I don't think you get that in normal universities. Now they work 48 weeks a year. They don't get the summer holidays off and, and they, they don't have freshers week and all that stuff, but, um, but what they get is a really rich education. Now, at the end of that four years, there's no bond. They can go, we pay, we pay a salary, we pay their accommodation, we pay all the student fees. You pay a salary while they're going through school? Absolutely. Well, they're working for us, so we, they should get paid a salary. How, how many students have you put through this program? So we started it two years ago. We roughly have about 45 in each cohort, so we're two cohorts in. Uh, the third one will start soon. Now, we're getting about 900 applications for 45 places. Really interestingly, because of the quality of those applications, we can actually force the fit. 45% last year were female yeah. in that course, which is about three times the national average for an engineering course. So we're able to do so many different things uh, because we now have control of that, that educational program. Fascinating. Yeah, and do you have, do you, are, are they getting, are, are people trying to poach them away from you? Not right now. I'm sure that may happen as they graduate <laughs> and so on. But again, it's beholden on to us to make sure that we, we keep them inside the tent, so to speak. But I imagine that some of these, uh, some of these young engineers will, will have a passion for starting their own business at the end of their, their, their degree. And we, we wish them good luck. As the, the only thing we would ask would be that they, they use that education and they use that environment to the betterment of the world by designing something which, which helps uh, in an engineering or a STEM sense. So uh, you revealed recently that you're working on an electric car. No, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. Well, I, I mean, uh, it's a long way from hair dryers and air purifiers and 
uh, vacuum cleaners to a car. And, and it's a pretty crowded marketplace. I mean, you look right now and a lot of car makers are, well, obviously Tesla's struggling, but uh, car demand is falling. Why would you enter that market? It's actually not as far away as you might think. If you look at the core constituents of what is unique in EV, uh, what, are, what are the key components that you need to be to be successful and where can you differentiate and where can you disrupt? We actually have a lot of those constituent parts. So we've built over 60 million digital motors, which I think is more than probably anybody else on the planet. You learn a lot when you build 60 million of anything. Hmm. Uh, and we know the reliability, we know the, the metallurgy of that, we know the material science, uh, and we've managed to be able to use that to produce a digital motor, which we think can outperform those that are available and kind of into the future. Battery and battery technology has been something which we've heavily invested in especially solid state batteries and, and the next generation of that. Airflow, we're pretty good at airflow. Most of our products use it to some extent. Uh, and airflow is a huge part, both internally, you know, in terms of environmental control within the car, uses a huge amount of energy from EV, or you lose a huge amount of range if you don't have uh, the proper drag coefficients and so on uh, in a car. So we actually have, and mechanical engineering is where we started. Um, a large part of the, uh, of the EV, of course, is mechanical engineering in itself. So when you put all those together, now it's a big complicated project, but it's an engineering project. You break it down into small engineering projects, it becomes problems to solve, and we like sol solving problems. Yeah. So, it, it, How long is it going to be before uh, those cars will be on the marketplace? We're saying ar uh, around 2021. 20, yeah, when we, when we expect to kind of launch the first, uh, the first look, vehicle. Look forward to seeing it. Anybody out here have a question? Uh, for, for Jim Rowan. Can you then give, because we want people to have takeaways from this conference, can you, uh, you think back to the McKinsey study we were looking at yeah. earlier about the companies that are able to put uh, design at their core. Can you provide your best advice to people who are trying to figure out how, how to get there? Yeah, I think design as and of itself is obviously not the answer. It's building a culture which fosters that and fosters the collaboration uh, between the different departments. Now, you need some tension. You need, you, you need to have some, you know, torque within the system to get the best products out. You need to have the manufacturing guys saying, this is crazy, there's no way we can make this. And a strong enough design team that says, well, that's going to make the best products, so figure it out. Uh, and you need that, otherwise you bring out bland products. And if you look at some of the geometry and you look just how tightly packed, some of our products are, you can imagine there's a lot of conversations going on between the different teams in our company. Because the manufacturing guys just want to make it this big. The design yeah. guys want to make it half as, half as small again. <laughs> so you need to make sure that you get the functionality, but you also get the usability for the consumer. One of the things that came out of the McKinsey study was that 95% of the executives they talked to were struggling with how do you, uh, how do you analyze design with the same rigor that you analyze financial results? Yeah, and, and, and it's a great question because I don't know that you can do it in the same way that you analyze the financial results. In some ways, it's an output, uh, and you see that coming back from the consumer. So we do a huge amount of insights in our, our lab, our, our, uh, our software lab in Shanghai, for example, uh, our hardware lab as well we've got now there. We've built a whole home within our, within our office. We built a Chinese home which is replicated pretty much size for size, furniture um, and so on. And we have a glass wall that we watch. We then invite people to come in. You and bring in actual product. consumers. And they know, they know that we're, we're watching from the That's not side. the way the world worked uh, 10, 20 years ago. People oh, would hide the product until it was ready to be yeah. put out into the world. We bring them in. We ask them what they like, what they don't like. So we take all of that and that all feeds back into the design real time. Uh, and then, of course, there's no global design any longer. You really need to be designing for localities. In fact, you need to be designing for individuals almost at this yeah. point in time. So this mass customization is something which is becoming much more prevalent and something that we should be embracing rather than trying to push back. Um, Can you talk about your decision to move the head company headquarters here to Singapore? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a pretty simple decision. We'd been on the cars for a long time. Uh, but basically, if you look, we'd always done manufacturing here for the last 10 years or so. On top of that, and the full product manufacturing, that is, was done mainly in Malaysia. We then came into Singapore and started building our digital motors, where we could get the skills, where we could get the support, where we could get the material and the logistics. 
And of course, Singapore had built up this um, capability in terms of precision engineering through the, the, you know, the disk drive manufacturers that had been here and the semiconductor guys. And then our explosion of sales in Southeast Asia. So when you, when you put on manufacturing, additional sales or digital close, motor capability. Close to market. And then of course the EV yeah. investment, the electric vehicle investment, the battery investment here, it made sense for us to move our headquarters here as well. Yeah, well, fascinating. We look forward to we look forward to those cars. We look forward to seeing what other problems you solve for consumers in the future. Thank you very you much. Bet.